Welcome to our continuing series of virtual voices focusing on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We are very, very pleased to have with us today Dr. Sergei Yakelchik. Western media often portrays Russia's war against Ukraine as a conflict over history that is specific to these two countries, or as Russia's reaction to real or perceived threats to its security. Dr. Yakelchik will talk about why neither of these explanations should be taken seriously and why the real causes and consequences of Russian aggression deserves the world's attention as soon as possible. This war is an assault on open society in general, which comes complete with global economic and environmental impacts on the entire planet. Professor Yakovchik was born and educated in Ukraine. He received his PhD from the University of Alberta and is the author of seven books on modern Ukrainian history and Russia-Ukrainian relations, including the award-winning book, Stalin Citizens, Everyday Politics in the Wake of Total War, published by Oxford University Press a professor of history and Slavic studies at the University of Victoria. Professor Yakovch is the current president of the Canadian Association for Ukrainian Studies. Over to you, Professor Yakovch. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Darbak. Thank you so much uh, for everybody at the World Information Transfer uh, for inviting me. And uh, thank you to the audience for showing up for this talk. It's a great pleasure to be virtually uh, in a very interesting place, a very important place in today's world. Uh, physically, of course, I am on the Pacific coast of Canada um, on the island, on Vancouver Island, where it is early morning. Um, and today I'm actually going to talk to you about something unfolding in the third location. Neither New York, nor the East Coast, nor the West Coast, but uh, Eastern Europe. And the importance of Eastern Europe used to be very difficult to explain. When I was hired as a professor here at the University of Victoria in 2001, coming from the University of Michigan and Arbor, where I was a postdoc, you would need to make a case for talking about Ukraine or even Russia, because back in 2001, it seemed that with the end of the Cold War and the global dominance of the United States practically unchallenged, a new world order was taking shape. Back then, the Russian-Ukrainian issues seemed inconsequential, something really minor. And the only referencing point for us Ukrainian Canadians was in fact to say that there's a special strategic and historical and cultural relationship between Canada and Ukraine because of so many Ukrainian Canadians who played a major role in making Canada a modern nation. How all of this have changed. It's just unbelievable um, that today you wouldn't need any other entry points, any segues into the discussion of the strategic situation in East Central Europe, or for that matter, um, to the issue of Ukrainian history. And of course, the reason for that is the war, which great many media outlets um, and quite a few commentators believe have started on February 24th, 2022. So one of the first points uh, we in the profession, uh, Ukrainian historians and specialists on Ukraine make is of course that the war has not started this year. The war has been going on as a conflict with a greater or smaller intensity of fire exchanges for eight years before that, since 2014. But in a way, an important argument of my today's presentation is that it goes even beyond that. That in fact, the very proclamation of Ukrainian independence in 1991 was the moment when the Russian authorities started having problems 
acknowledging the existence of independent Ukraine. And beyond that, in 1917, the proclamation of the Ukrainian non-Bolshevik Republic was a problem for the Russian political forces of all varieties, for the Reds, the Bolsheviks, the Whites, those who supported the monarchy, those who wanted to go back to a parliamentary republic, all of them agreed that Ukraine could not let go. And indeed, of course, the conclusion of revolutionary struggles during 1917-1921 was precisely that anyone, that at least one version of Russian imperialism had to win. And so it did, the Bolshevik version. And so now when looking at the longer history the, of the Ukrainian-Russian relations, we understand that things currently being presented as important factors in the conflict are very often no more than excuses. But because I started with history, let me deal with the history part first, very quickly. Um, the Russian President Vladimir Putin is very fond of uh, presenting himself as a historian. He, in fact, uh, writes articles or claims uh, to have written historical articles and spends considerable time discussing history during his various press conferences, which, by the way, the Russian government announced would not happen this June as expected. Um, at, at these events and in those texts, Mr. Putin always consistently argues that Ukraine has no right to exist as an independent nation, that there is no such thing as a Ukrainian ethnic identity, and Ukraine has always been part of Russia. The very creation of the Ukrainian Republic within the Soviet Union, he blames squarely on Lenin. Interestingly enough, not on Stalin, though that's because Stalin has to be always in the Russian narratives, the positive character, and Lenin can be a negative character. And so, if in this historical scheme, Ukraine looks um, like an artificial entity, which has no basis whatsoever in a modern world. But of course, one notable problem with this narrative is that it seems to be based on a pre-modern understanding of what a nation is, on the understanding which we last encountered in the years of World War II, coming from the extreme right in Europe, the ethnic nation. So Mr. Putin's claim for the unity of Russians and Ukrainians, which is propagated in his article on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, is in fact based on a very interesting understanding of ethnicity. Uh, he claims that both ethnic Russians living outside of Russia and the Russian speakers living outside of Russia all essentially are compatriots. This is the term used in the Russian Federation for, for such groups. And because they are compatriots, they're expected to be interested in joining Russia. And that is a very interesting reasoning. It's a reasoning which Hitler notably used uh, during the Austrian Anschluss in 1938. And some of us thought that this logic itself went out in favor after 1945, because one could not assume in, in the modern world simply that blood and belonging, uh, blood and soil, uh, to quote Hitler, defined, determined your political views and your membership in the nation. And yet somehow, this is precisely what Mr. Putin is assuming about Ukrainians and particularly Eastern Ukrainians and those uh, living uh, in Ukraine who are ethnic Russians or Russian speakers. So this assumption is then um, a very much mid 20th century assumption. But of course, modern nations are not like that. Modern nations are political communities which are defined by ideas, by shared attitude to democracy, by shared belief in political institutions. They're not really based at all on your ethnic belonging. But that is the problem for Mr. Putin because his picture of the world is 
a combination of two imperial worldviews. One comes from the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union, and it has something to do with the continued existence of a large empire on the Eurasian continent. Now, that particular thesis has interesting historical roots uh, going all the way back to the relationship between the Golden Horde and Muscovy, uh, which of course for Russia was seen as progressive because the Mongols allowed the Principality of Moscow to develop into a major political center. And in subsequent Russian political ideology in the 20th century, the Mongol rule was seen as uh, enabling a mighty Russia to develop. Interestingly enough, it's directly opposite in the Ukrainian case. In the Ukrainian case, the Mongol conquest of 1240, the, the fall of Kiev in 1240 is actually a, a tragedy. And it's remembered as such. It's not the moment of enabling uh, state development. And so these two very opposite attitudes to the event which happened many centuries ago actually tell us quite a bit about the nature of political regime developing in Russia and the political system developing in Ukraine after independence. So that's one imperial notion, the mighty empire which is destined to control the Eurasian prairies of steppes. But the other one, which is inherited not really from the Soviet Union, but rather straight from the Russian Empire, is an ethnic understanding, but a very awkward ethnic understanding of the empire. The Soviet Union did acknowledge that the Ukrainians constituted a separate ethnicity. Because of the precedent of Ukrainian statehood in 1917-1920, the Soviet Union included the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. It was an answer to the Ukrainian struggle for independence starting in 1917. It was not a creation of something based on theory, but it was a very pragmatic answer as most of Lenin's actions really were, extremely pragmatic political answer to the existing challenge, the challenge of Ukrainian nationhood. But it was the Russian Empire rather than the Soviet Union, which in fact denied any ethnic difference between the Russians and the Ukrainians. The Russian Empire, as we know, banned publications in the Ukrainian language. It also insisted on Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians constituting the three parts of the greater Russian nation. For that reason, um, it felt that educating by educating Ukrainians and Belarusians in Russian, they would basically make them cultured Russians rather than Ukrainians and Belarusians with developed high culture, which the empire sought to suppress. So on two accounts then, we have Ukraine as a problem, as a challenge to the notion of Russia to the notion of Russia as an empire which controls the territories around it because of geopolitics. And this geopolitics is somehow connected to Genghis Khan and Batu Khan and all of these other wonderful things from the 13th century. And the second one, uh, the challenge to the notion of greater Russia, including all the Eastern Slavs, Ukrainians and Belarusians. That is um, a concept which is really based on a very awkward understanding in the Tsarist Empire of what an ethnic group is. The Tsarist Empire fought against modernity in a variety of ways because it feared modernity. Famously, Tsar Nicholas I refused to invest into industrial development because he thought industrial development leads to urban revolts like in Europe. He didn't want to be like Europe and that's why he lost the Crimean War. But the Russian Empire also wanted to slow down the process of national development. It didn't invest in making the Russian peasants aware of their Russianness. You would normally think that if the empire invests in suppressing Ukrainian culture, then it would try to impose the Russian culture on the Ukrainian peasantry. And yet, this did not actually happen. The empire did not pursue a coherent or systematic or large-scale campaign of assimilation. It believed 
in the pre-existing unity, very much like Mr. Putin. And what happens in this picture is that if you believe in pre-existing unity of Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians, and for the Tsarist Empire, it was based actually on the shared religion, on Eastern Orthodoxy. If you believe in this shared unity, then any attempt to establish a separate notion of the Ukrainian nation or the Belarusian nation is an attempt at subverting the empire. And the Russian Empire, famously or perhaps infamously, blamed all such attempts on Europe. It's actually very similar to Mr. Putin's ideology because in his historical articles, that's precisely what he says, that it was Europe in various shapes, either Poland or the Austro-Hungarian Empire or these days the European Union and the United States included in the wider uh, definition of Europe. And as you realize, the United States and Canada did participate in, uh, in some important uh, conferences on security in Europe. So in this sense, uh, they do belong to Europe too. Uh, a very interesting notion established in the 1970s, um, or at least to the global West. And so it is again, like in Tsarist times, it is Europe or the global West that, that is trying to create Ukraine. So that kind of an argument coming from uh, Mr. Putin and the, the Russian media is of course different from the argument that Ukraine is close to Russia strategically. Russia is entitled to control the entire Eurasian continent. Therefore, Ukraine should be with Russia. These are two different, one geopolitical, second uh, basically ethnic in an undeveloped way, ethnic argument. But nevertheless, both of them coexist in Russian ideology today. Uh, like the ideology of every empire in history, it is a hybrid ideology. Empire is a hybrid almost by definition. And therefore, it shouldn't come as a surprise to us that the Russian empire uses both arguments today to argue that independent Ukraine is impossible. We also shouldn't surprised really by the fact that Mr. Putin blames the creation of Ukraine on Lenin. And at the same time, the, the Russian troops in Ukraine, the Russian troops in Ukraine are actually restoring or helping rebuild monuments to Lenin removed previously in, in Ukrainian cities. So Lenin is no hero in Russia, but in Ukraine, of course, the figure of Lenin underwent a different symbolic transformation. The monuments to Lenin in Ukraine were seen before this war, and perhaps even during this war, as symbolizing something else, not the Bolshevik ideology, definitely not the collapse of the Tsarist Empire, but rather the historical unity with Russia. So interestingly enough, then in Russian ideology for Ukraine, Lenin is positive. In the Russian ideology for Russia, Lenin is negative. So these things can be combined in imperial discourse, and they are combined in an imperial discourse. Now, now that we have established an important point at the very beginning, that modern states are political communities, and they're also political communities of choice, we also establish something rather significant, the notion of human rights, which comes built into this concept because it is your choice as citizens that creates the political nation. You're not born into it. You definitely do not belong to Mr. Putin's Russia, even if you happen to speak Russian at home. And this is what they have seen during the war in a variety of ways, especially the Russian failure to take the city of Kharkiv, which is the closest large city to the Russian border, which was thought to be a kind of low dangling fruit, an easy one to pick. And yet, and yet, Kharkiv remains Ukrainian, even so it is an overwhelmingly Russian speaking cities, the citizens enrolled in territorial defenses, and the city is still Ukrainian. Even in the city of Kherson, which was captured by the Russian forces, and if you have been to Kherson, or perhaps you are from Kherson, you would probably agree that it is an overwhelmingly Russian-speaking city. And it was very difficult to hear Ukrainian in Kherson until perhaps 
the last couple of years. And of course, the last couple of years would be what? The previous war with Russia, the lower intensity war with Russia. And so it means that the language or ethnic identity do not determine loyalty. That was an unpleasant surprise for Russia when the war started. We can say it with certainty that plan A, Mr. Putin's plan A was in fact built on the assumption that the Ukrainian authorities have no support within the country. This very idea of sending small groups of paratroopers by helicopters uh, to target a few strategic uh, objects and to take out the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian military command clearly was built, and I cannot resist of saying this, on a Hitler-like scenario. It's actually funny that for all this emphasis in the Russian textbooks and Russian universities on the so-called Great Patriotic War, which is presented in a completely mythologized way, um, basically not discussing the war crimes of the Red Army, trying to diminish the contribution of the allies in any way. In for all of this Russian concern with being the keepers of the sacred myth of the Great Patriotic War, they never really paid an attention to the sentence which appears in great many textbooks. Hitler believed that the Soviet Union would collapse. So as soon as you kick out, as you kick in the door, the house will come down, he said. And of course, the Russian textbooks would go on to say, oh, but he underestimated the internal cohesion of the Soviet people and blah, blah, blah. Um, but of course, the very same argument would apply to Mr. Putin's plans for Ukraine. He believed, strangely enough, he believed his own propaganda. He believed his um, ethnic, imperial, and in some way racial um, ideology of Ukrainians not being a real nation. So it came as a nasty surprise to the Russian military planners, to Mr. Putin, and to the Russian public. And this is because up to that point, I was actually talking about the Russian authorities, but it is probably time to mention that the Russian public is, by and large, in support of Mr. Putin's agenda in Ukraine. And that fits with uh, my previous example, why the Soviet Union defended itself. Well, because the imperial ideologies are shared by the population, and there were the entire generation, or perhaps two in the Soviet Union, who believed in socialism, by and large, especially when we speak of the urban educated youth. It was always very different with the peasantry, and especially in Ukraine. But the big cities, oh yes, they had a fair share of Stalinists, and some of the Stalinists, very few, are still alive in very advanced years. But they wholeheartedly support Mr. Putin's agenda. And so there is some parallel there, um, which basically tells us that, that Mr. Putin's regime is very fond of presenting Ukraine as a Nazi state or neo-Nazi state. But in fact, the historical parallels with Nazism lead us straight to Mr. Putin's window in the Kremlin, where he is sitting and writing all these wonderful texts. So what is then the Ukrainian nation which Russia cannot possibly understand? Well, the Ukrainian nation which Russia cannot figure out is based on political unity on the choice defined as Europe. This Europe, as I said, is a metaphor. It doesn't actually mean the European Union. It means something else. It means the, the global West, including the United States and Canada, interestingly enough. It's a notion of basically, you know, living under the rule of law in the land in which there is no massive corruption and there is an equal economic opportunity for all and in the country which is not a dictatorship. So these notions are much wider than Europe, much wider than the European Union, but for Ukrainians, they very often come together in one slogan, that of Europe, belonging to Europe or joining Europe. Ukrainians for now have little experience with the bureaucracies of the European Union. At, at some point, uh, they will acquire such experience. They are acquiring this experience already uh, 
during the war when it comes to uh, timely delivery of weapons promised and such things. But for now, Europe functions as a wonderful metaphor. And it's great when there is such a wonderful metaphor for Ukrainians to use because it provides them with what? With an example. It provides them with an example of what they can strive towards as citizens. And this notion, again, should be flipped now and applied to Mr. Putin's Russia. If Europe is an example for Ukraine, can Ukraine potentially be an example for Russia? Here, I think we arrive to the really important moment of um, acknowledging a major source of Russian discontent over independent Ukraine. Ukraine can be an example for Russia. We sometimes, and I very often do it in my talks as well, we sometimes think of it in terms of a positive example. Uh, Ukraine can indeed, in some longer perspective, be a prosperous and well-functioning democracy. And in this way, it could demonstrate an example to Russia, just as Europe, quote unquote, demonstrates an example to Ukraine. But of course, Ukraine can also be an example of something else, not the democracy achieved, not the prosperity built, but of the rebellion of citizens against an oppressive authoritarian regime. And this really is at the heart of Mr. Putin's hatred for Ukraine. So in addition to these historical reasons, which he is openly mentioning, but they really belong to two different categories as we have just established. In addition to that, and much more important than those historical reasons, there is a Ukrainian example of, of going through two massive protest movements resulting in two democratic revolutions, the Orange Revolution in 2004, 2005, and the Revolution of Dignity in 2013, 2014. Of course, the Russian aggression in 2014 followed up immediately uh, after the victory of the revolution. But even during the Orange Revolution of 2004, 2005, Mr. Putin was already in the picture behind the scene reportedly um, suggesting that the Ukrainian authorities consider a violent crackdown on, on the protesters. And why would he do that? One reason is, of course, that he really liked the kind of Ukraine that existed before the revolution. He would have preferred uh, Mr. Kuchma's Ukraine, or better yet, Mr. Yanukovych's Ukraine, the names of two more pro-Russian presidents in recent Ukrainian history. But even beyond that, the trouble was the precedent. The precedent that the Russian public could possibly organize itself in the way Ukrainians could. And there was indeed an attempt in Russia during 2011 and 2012 in particular of holding mass protest rallies in major cities against Mr. Putin's continued rule, or Mr. Putin and Mr. Medvedev's continued rule, but essentially Mr. Putin's. These rallies, especially in Moscow and St. Petersburg, were violently suppressed with the riot police beating up the protesters, arresting them, with all kinds of consequences for the protesters. And that was the moment when Russia decisively turned against the society, not just the Ukrainian society, not just the strong Ukrainian civil society, which was behind the revolutions, but also against its own society. So in the years since 2011, 2012, the Russian government was um, methodically, systematically closing down all the opportunities for the expression of oppositional discourse. It was preventing any mass protests with legislation, heavy fines, and um, suing the protesters on behalf of bus companies, because allegedly buses cannot run, city buses cannot run because the protesters are protesting. Therefore, the protesters are liable for millions and millions in damages, coming up with all kinds of strategies of attacking political dissidents, uh, presenting some of them as a as, as very infamous case of a historian working on Stalinist terror, present, presenting him and others 
um, as criminals with, with a criminal record which would not be immediately um, obvious for the international community as a political persecution, presenting them as, um, as a corrupt individuals, as pedophiles, as, as foreign agents, all kinds of things used rather skillfully, systematically in order to close down the possibilities for public expression and also uh, to destroy any possible media platform for oppositional discourse. So Mr. Putin's regime came to that moment of attacking of an all out attack on Ukraine on February 24th, well prepared. It not only was prepared for massive sanctions, not on the same scale as they actually happened, but on a rather large scale, and the Russia did bulletproof itself or waterproof itself uh, quite, quite well against the sanctions as we are going to see and now and in the next few months. Uh, but also, in addition to that, by basically closing down civil society, destroying it completely, atomizing the Russian society in the way even Stalin didn't manage to. And this explains why so few people protested the war in the Russian cities. Obviously, uh, Ukrainians and specialists on Ukraine are grateful to those who did protest, to those who left Russia and joined the voices of opposition and quite a few Russians in Europe are in fact assisting with uh, Ukrainian refugees in Europe. But this percentage is enormously small. And the reason why it's small is twofold. Uh, one, of course, as I've just said, that the Russian civil society has no platform, really, for organizing. Now the internet is controlled at an unprecedented level. Even China is not really that far into controlling the internet. Um, but the other is, of course, the imperial ideology, which I referred to earlier, and the fact that imperial ideology does work with the Russian public. And it does work for the Russian public for the reason that the Russian public was never forced into settling accounts with its past. And that is really another big problem. Not only the lack of civil society, but also the lack of reckoning. Because the Russian Empire almost immediately became the Soviet Union, another multinational state which shared so many characteristics of a modern empire, including using violence to suppress national movements, including using genocide against Ukrainians. It meant that there was only a brief period in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, when the notion of empire, and more specifically, the Russian empire, was condemned, at least publicly. Already in the 1930s, it became a positive notion again, under Stalin's slogan of the great leadership and guidance of the great Russian people, the leaders of the Soviet Union. So what it really meant is that that moment of the 1920s, which was in itself a concession to the Ukrainian national movement and other national movements, is thoroughly forgotten by now. Uh, and the Russian public really went through several generations of modern intellectuals and teachers and professionals who believed that Russia had the right to control the empire and Ukrainians were not really a separate nation. And when we deal with the legacy of that, it is entirely understandable that the Russian public is supportive of Mr. Putin's policies. That's for the reason that they identify with the empire. There never was, in fact, a positive and coherent project of creating a modern Russian nation that would not be imperial. In the early 1990s, there was a brief moment when those of us, and I was living in Ukraine at the time, um, that those of us observing the immediate post-Soviet years had quite, quite a strong belief in the possibility of a democratic Russia emerging. And our hopes were, ident were identified with the figure of President Boris Yeltsin. 
you would realize too that the Soviet Union and the former Yugoslavia collapsed in two very different ways. The collapse of Yugoslavia immediately resulted in the war initiated by the dominant nation of the former federation, leading to genocide, whereas the Soviet Union did not immediately descend into the war. Russia did not attack uh, Ukraine in 1991. So that attack, the delayed time bomb from the Soviet period, really happened after the two democratic revolutions established a new concept of Ukraine. Ukraine as a challenge and a possible example to the Russian society. But that attack nevertheless happened. And so it really confirms that even so the Russian authorities in the 1990s positioned themselves as democratic, already by 1993, if not earlier, really, because the Yeltsin regime was never free of uh, the claims to Crimea, for instance, to Crimea being really Russian. So it only took the short two years or less, or fewer, uh, to, for, for Mr. Yeltsin's regime to retreat into the familiar rhetoric of imperial greatness and the Russian national pride which came complete with an understanding of the Russian, Russian pride being injured by the imperial collapse. So within two years, really, Yeltsin was back to saying that the Soviet Union collapsed and that was the bad thing because, because the ethnic Russians did not receive what they were entitled to. I think um, President Leonid Kuchma of Ukraine who did many things condemned by international community, actually did one thing which remains underappreciated. He did manage during his first term as president to negotiate with Russia and to receive from Yeltsin the assurances that he can remove the Crimean president Yuri Meshkov and bring Crimea back into the Ukrainian constitutional system. How Kuchma managed to achieve that is a big question which would require another hour long lecture. But I think it is an important example for the future, for the future in which Crimea will one day be incorporated back into Ukraine. Of course, on a very different understanding of what Crimea is, on the understanding that is already present in Ukrainian history textbooks today, that Crimea is not Ukrainian and neither is Russian, but it is a land of the Crimean Tatars who are part of Ukrainian history and part of Ukrainian uh, notion of nationhood. And that that incorporation of the Crimea may want to kind of, may potentially use some strategic moves from the period in the 1990s. Now, so when we talk about the two Ukrainian revolutions, it is fairly clear that the first one took Russia by surprise. Mr. Putin was behind the scenes. There was a Russian propaganda um, the Russian government apparently suggested a violent crackdown, but it did not happen. It also demonstrated something else. The involvement of the West. A number of political figures, especially from Europe, and also some retired political figures, former presidents, rushed into the Ukrainian capital of Kiev as international intermediaries. And so that created an important precedent, especially because, especially because uh, Russia had accepted the existence of international intermediaries and actually sent its own representative into the group of international intermediaries. That established a precedent of the Ukrainian quote unquote problem being really a global issue being much larger than the issue of Russian history, the issue of Russia being unable to sort out its imperial past, and even the issue of Russia seeing 
the Ukrainian civil society as a dangerous example to its own people, potentially. It is actually the issue of democracy around the world and the methods being used to uh, maintain oppressive regimes and suppress uh, revolutionary protest. Now, the moment Russia implicitly acknowledged that by sending its own representative in 2004, was the moment when the Ukrainian policy of orienting itself towards Europe started paying off, started bringing fruits. Because Europe woke up. Very few people now would remember the early 1990s. Also, we do go back quite often to the concept of the Budapest Memorandum, named of the, the capital of Hungary, where Ukraine surrendered its nuclear arsenal in exchange for the security guarantees, which of course later turned out to be worth nothing. Um, and that was the moment which is now seen very often as a big historical mistake. Um, quite a few Ukrainian intellectuals and politicians make noises about, you know, the value of keeping potentially the nuclear arsenal back in 1994. But of course, they forget about the important context of 1994, and especially 1993, when the early American policy, especially pronounced uh, really um, under George Bush the senior, being that it is Russia, the imagined, imaginary projected democratic Russia, that is your main contact point in Eastern Europe. Uh, so you have to be friends with Russia and then Russia would somehow control the developments in the region, potentially very violent developments. It was only the Clinton administration in the mid 1990s that rediscovers the point of Ukraine's strategic importance for the world and also really for Russia as well. It becomes clear to them, and of course Russia has to accomplish quite a few things like shelling the parliament, like issuing revanchist statements, like being unreliable and violent, um, carpet bombing villages and cities on its own territory in Chechnya, doing all kinds of things. It, it takes the West a while to figure out that it's not the Russia who should be supported as an example to the rest of the post-Soviet space. It really is Ukraine and other uh, former Soviet republics that need to be supported in order to keep Russia in check. When that understanding is established, after that, Ukraine becomes an important recipient of financial aid from the West. It becomes really important, the cornerstone in European security, which it remains today and even more so now when Russia has openly attacked Ukraine, openly aiming to destroy the Ukrainian state. But the overall context of the early 1990s was in fact fairly gloom. The efforts by Ukrainian officials to engage with the West brought very limited um, response. And the reasons for that, in addition to the attempt to save money on the embassies, you know, maybe keeping a single embassy for the Commonwealth of Independent States, this umbrella organization, which turned out to be uh, completely impotent, would have been cheaper than opening embassies in all the 15 Soviet republics, former Soviet republics, and then investing into some of them. So it was really Russia which made it clear to the West that they have to do it and they have to engage with the other 14 and primarily with the other 14. Now, that realization was an important factor, but the other one was of course, Ukrainians willingness to shed the Soviet legacy. And one component of that was getting rid of the nuclear weapons. Now, of course, there are plenty of publications on that moment in 1993, 94, when Ukraine was basically pushed by the West into doing this. Um, and fundamentally, 
Ukraine could not afford maintaining the nuclear um, arsenal it had because it was an older Soviet arsenal which required enormous economic um, effort, investment, and also carried with it um, the image of a rogue nuclear state which refuses to participate in international non-proliferation agreements. So back then in 1993-94, that seemed like a good choice. Uh, but of course, now we see the Budapest Memorandum as the moment of shame, not for Ukraine at all, but for the West, uh, which basically signed this memorandum and it's not binding as now uh, the ambassadors of the signatories were explaining to Ukrainian public, in particular the German ambassador. Well, so this way, this way we have acquired a Ukraine that exists now. A Ukraine which established its orientation toward the West and forced the West, with Russia's of course, awkward help, to acknowledge the importance of Ukraine as a strategic moment in Europe. And of course, what is happening now is that Ukrainian history is going to be even more important than ever. The universities are going to be hiring more Ukrainian specialists, including people from Ukraine. And this is already happening even in my province. Um, uh, the University of British Columbia in Vancouver is doing this now. And this is because the importance of Ukraine is now revealed to be global. It is revealed in a way which is very painful for Ukrainians because it establishes references to the tragedies in the Ukrainian past. Because the Russian occupation of the towns and villages around Kiev came complete with atrocities, with war crimes and crimes against humanity, which have strong parallels in Ukrainian history during the Russian occupation of Galicia in 1914, 1915 and World War I, during the Nazi occupation of the entire Ukrainian Republic during World War II, and the violent return of the Soviet power. All of these things resonate very strongly with Ukrainians. And of course, the other moment, the other moment, that is the threat of famine which emanates from the Russian policy of blockading the Ukrainian ports and also is one of those kind of Russian blackmail moments. Russia is really good at uh, blackmailing international community in this way. That moment of preventing the grain from getting to the people has also important parallels in Ukrainian history because for modern Ukrainians, for those who grew up in independent Ukraine, the notion of the Holodomor or a terror famine under Stalin, which was a genocide against the Ukrainian political nation, now resonates stronger than ever. It seems that again, Russia is pushing Ukraine into reliving the experiences of the mid 20th century not just with this ethnic and almost racial ideology of Mr. Putin's regime, and not just with the notion of the empire, which is not really even 20th century, it's more like 19th century notion of the empire, but now also with the notion of genocides, not in a singular, but in plural, because we do deal with a physical extermination by military force by the occupying army, and we also deal with a threat of hunger, with the Ukrainian grain being confiscated by the Russian army. And that sounds very familiar and very painful to any historian of Ukraine and any citizen of Ukraine. So I'm probably going to stop here at that point by saying that I think I've shown um, that in a variety of ways, um, the Russian design is to take Ukraine and the world with it back into the period of totalitarian regimes, genocides, and ethnic-based cleansings. 
But of course, Ukraine is a very modern society, a society built by two democratic revolutions in which there was a prominent participation of other ethnic groups. The most recent revolution was started, of course, by an Afghani journalist living in Ukraine. And Ukraine now has a Jewish president. So it basically only the most visible symbols of what Ukraine really is, a civil society which knows its power, which feels it will be able to control the state, and which does not need this outdated uh, language of um, what is your ethnicity? Let me check your passport, like in the Soviet Union. It does determine for Mr. Putin who Ukrainian and Russian is, but it doesn't determine it in the real global world. So I'm going to stop here and I would be happy to entertain some questions. And thank you very, very much, Professor Yakil Shuk, for actually wonderful presentation that will allow the people that are listening to it to learn a great deal. Uh, I would now um, forward the questions to Susie, who will be asking you the questions that we have received. Susie. Thank you so much. The first question from our audience is, in your opinion, are there any Russians who really care about what's happening in Ukraine and are against the crime and atrocities that are happening there today? I want to believe so. I do know some people who have left Russia soon after the invasion. Um, I do know the Russians living abroad who are volunteering, helping the Ukrainian refugees. And these people happen to be part of my Facebook bubble. And of course, we all know that Facebook bubbles are selective and in a way self-selective too. That by definition, the Russians who are my friends on Facebook and whose stories I saw are not your typical Russians. But it indicates that there is some hope because they do come from educated professional classes people who can afford to leave Russia because they will be able to fit in the West. But it also indicates that we should be critical towards our bubbles. During the last presidential election, my entire Facebook bubble was persuaded completely. And whoever tried to argue the opposite was immediately attacked with all kinds of comments that Poroshenko would be reelected president. So, when Zelensky delivered a resounding defeat to Mr. Poroshenko, very few people in my bubble engaged in the discussion of why did that happen. And so I am aware that the Russians in my bubble are, of course, the ones who, to start with, were in opposition to Mr. Putin's regime. And also that Mr. Putin's regime by now has shaped in a profound way the opinion of the Russian public. One big question on my mind, as well as on the minds of other commentators, is whether the war itself is going to influence the Russian public opinion. Uh, in the early stage of the war, Western analysts often assumed, and many in Ukraine hoped, that the body bags coming home to Russia and the collapse in the standard of life would help build discontent against Mr. Putin's tyranny in the same way as the movement of soldiers' mothers during the Afghanistan war in the 1980s helped undermine the Soviet Union, helped really destroy the Soviet Union. But of course, we now realize that the movement of soldiers' mothers during the Soviet uh, war in Afghanistan also happened at the moment when the state allowed glasnost, allowed the relatively free and relatively open expression of public opinion, allowed the press to pursue an independent line. In other words, there was an infrastructure for the civil society to form and organize itself against the authorities. That has not been happening so far in Russia. We don't see the signs of that. And of course, Russia now has 
no independent media whatsoever. Like the last three outlets which presented themselves as somewhat oppositional, also trying not to cross, not to cross the final red lines. And of course, Mr. Putin has a ton of red lines and they're kind of shifting goalposts too. All of these uh, outlets are now either closed or uh, evade or av avoid, avoid um, discussing the war at all. So uh, the outlook is quite gloomy, really. And also because it, it is difficult to see how a decisive defeat um, can be brought upon Russia in this war, given the power of the propaganda. Um, many of us expected that um, defeating the Russian army in Ukraine, inflicting significant casualties on the Russian army in itself would be seen as a defeat. But of course, now that Russia fully controls the information flow, and if you look on the Russian newspapers, you'd be, of course, amazed at uh, how they cover the world and the war and all kinds of other things. But also given the fact that the West is feeding Mr. Putin's dictatorship with a billion dollars per month as payments for natural resources. So Russia basically has the control of the mass media, has unlimited funds, and uh, it's difficult to see a path towards removing Mr. Putin's regime. And under that circumstances, of course, the hope of Ukraine and the hope of an international community becomes that repulsing the invasion, that fighting back the Russian armies and removing them from the Ukrainian territory can be the moment when the war stops. Thank you for that response. Um, what will happen in Russia once Putin is no longer in power? And do you think the country will ever move toward more of a democracy? When Mr. Putin is no longer in power, there will be the new Putin who will come from uh, the same circle. And I think most Western commentators now agree on that. It is naive to assume that the Russian elites will remove Putin because of the war. Rather, after he is gone, there will be somebody from his own circle, educated by him, and the person who will continue to run uh, the empire in the same way, by completely suppressing the public voices, uh, not allowing any avenues for the opposition to mobilize the population and such. Uh, which is not to say that a revolution is impossible in Russia. It is possible. But I think at this point, it would take a combination of several factors, which would probably have to, to include um, Mr. Putin's sudden removal from power, let's say sudden death, um, an economic crisis reaching its height at the very same time, and possibly the growing perception of the military defeat in Ukraine. So if several factors like that come together in a single historical moment, then the entire political elite can lose control over Russia. And that would give an opening to uh, public voices. And of course, the big worry is, what are these voices going to be? As we all know, no Russian oppositional figure, with the exception of the journalist Ksenia Sovchak, has no active of oppositional figure in Russia expressed support for the idea of returning Crimea to Ukraine, for instance. Um, so the big issue is, and of course, Sovchak is a unique case because she can get away with lots of things because, because of the family's connection uh, to Mr. Putin. Um, so she is not indicative really of the Russian public opinion or the Russian opposition as such. Um, so I'm finding myself in a recognizable situation and that the position of Lenin really in 1917 when he is writing this article about what brings about the revolution. So it has to be the collapse of the old regime because the old regime is unable to govern in the same way any longer. Uh, it has to be a stronger position um, 
and has to be the moment when the opposition can mobilize the masses. As you see, Lenin, the ever pragmatic politician, actually came up with fairly good criteria of what it would take to crush the oppressive empire. And of course, he built an even more oppressive empire after he crushed the Russian empire. What opportunities do countries which support Ukraine during the war open for Ukrainian citizens? It's a double-edged sword. Um, I realize, of course, that we are dealing with a colossal human tragedy on a very large scale, which makes an impression on the world's imagination. Lots of individuals and countries and organizations, including my university, uh, is creating emergency scholarships for graduate students from Ukraine, which, by the way, the deadline is the end of the month. Um, and, um, you know, my neighbor just across the street uh, took a Ukrainian family in, into a small apartment he has uh, in the basement. And the society, the Westerners really mobilized for that. It's not just the Ukrainians living abroad, but the West itself mobilized for that. And we will never forget what Poland has done for Ukraine and also the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, uh, Romania as well. So basically this war and uh, the experience of being displaced people, of course, no country recognizes them as refugees. Canada certainly doesn't. Uh, it only accepts Ukrainians as uh, temporarily displaced um, persons for up to a three year period. Um, so some of these countries do have expectations which are not necessarily expressed openly in public, but they do come up in the media. And that is the workforce. Um, so we love Poland for a variety of reasons now, uh, but Poland also wants Ukrainians as a workforce. Canada is traditionally supportive of Ukraine, but the provinces here and the ministers here kind of use the vocabulary of 100 years earlier when Ukrainians originally arrived in Canada. It's a, it's a workforce. It's a people who are accustomed to working hard, but now that's a very different immigration which arrives now. It's highly educated, primarily women with children. These are not the people you can use to construct the Canadian Pacific Railway, like Ukrainians were used a century ago, actually more than a century ago. And so, and so um, there is then, there are two moments. The countries of the world are doing great thing, helping the people who are displaced by fighting. But it would be terrible if Ukraine loses forever, a very important section of its productive population. Uh, if a significant part of these people does not return, and sociologists do expect um, that a significant percentage would not return. So in a way, in a way, we also need to keep something else in mind. So when the Western countries are accepting Ukrainians, as temporarily displaced people, if not refugees. They should also be thinking of the future investment in rebuilding Ukraine. Without that commitment, Ukraine would lose even more of its uh, productive potential. And that should be part of the conversation from the very beginning, which I am aware it is, uh, the new Marshall Plan for Ukraine, but there is very little concrete detail about that, which is understandable, but nevertheless, this needs to be happening now. Susie? Is it important for Ukraine to be part of the EU, in your opinion? Yes, for a variety of reasons. As I've said, symbolic, because Europe is a metaphor for what kind of life Ukrainians would like to live. Um, but also pragmatic ones, because membership in the European Union, as has been shown in numerous research contributions, um, it kind of forces candidate countries to transform themselves. 
in terms of legislation, industrial standards, and such. It forces them also to recognize human rights, uh, to build genuine democracy, to fight corruption. So this process of becoming a member is an important moment of transformation. So it may not really change the Ukrainian situation overnight, because being a member of the European Union doesn't mean that they are going to be defending you militarily. But it's going to help transforming Ukraine, and that would make Ukraine stronger. Thank you. Um, why is Russia ignoring the history of Kiev Rus and, and was the first democracy? Um, it's not really ignoring it. Um, it's trying to decenter the history of medieval uh, Rus state, which of course uh, very often mistakenly rendered in English textbooks as ancient Russia but which was not, of course, Russia, uh, with the capital in Kiev. It's trying to dissenter that narrative uh, by claiming that it was the uh, Russian North that was really more important historically, Novgorod and the city of Ladoga, where the Vikings originally arrived before going down the Dnipro River to Kiev. Um, it's difficult to ignore it also because the Russian empire has designed a wonderful way of excluding Ukrainians. Um, in the Russian empire, it was uh, an official position debated really by, by historians in a very interesting way. And I'm waiting for this position to be completely affirmed in Mr. Putin's textbooks that Ukrainians were not really the residents of Kiev in ancient times. They came later from Galicia, from the West. Uh, where the original, the original citizens of Rus were actually the Russians who moved uh, essentially northeast later on to create modern Russia. And this is a ridiculous debate, which of course um, ignores a variety of present day approaches in the study of everyday life and social history. It seems to be based on the transfer of royal dynasty and maybe the religious center as well. But present day history is about the everyday experiences of ordinary people and there are multiple indications from uh, graffiti and other sources that the language spoken in ancient Kiev was in fact much closer to Ukrainian. It was not yet modern Ukrainian, of course, but definitely it was not modern Russian either. Um, and I, as I said, the most interesting moments are is how the two countries now treat the collapse of ancient Kiev in 1240, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. So for the Russian empire and for Mr. Putin today, it is fundamentally a good thing. The Mongols helped create the notion of a large empire powerful one. In Ukraine, it's a tragedy which destroyed uh, the glorious page of our history. Thank you very, very much, Professor Yerkovchuk. It, it's absolutely uh, fascinating, uh, uh, not only the current history, but also that you brought into uh, focus also the ancient Ukraine and uh, uh, their own, uh, how should I put, ancestral development. Uh, so uh, we are very, very grateful that you were able to come and uh, answer all the questions and gave us a brilliant <laughs> example of the development of both uh, the Russian empire and uh, the Ukrainian historical empire. Um, thank you for coming and uh, we wish you a wonderful, wonderful continuation of your very, very important and valuable work. And Susie, thank you very much for hosting and have a wonderful week ahead. Bye-bye.
Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye.